You're listening to the Patenting for Inventors podcast with registered patent attorney, Dr. Adam Diamond, founder of Diamond Patent Law, the number one source for securing your intellectual property needs. Now, here's your host, Adam Diamond. Hello and welcome to the Patenting for Inventors podcast bonus episode four, interview of product innovation and management consultant, Eric Rose. My name is Adam Diamonds, a registered patent attorney and founder and owner of Diamonds Patent Law in Los Angeles, California. I can be contacted through my website at diamondspatentlaw.com, that's D-I-A-M-E-N-T, patentlaw.com, or call me at 424-281-0162. And this interview was done over the internet, so there are a couple sound issues, but for the most part, I think it actually came out pretty well. Hope you enjoy. Uh, this week, I have on Eric Rose. Eric Rose is a product innovation and management consultant and has a company called Pinnacle Product Innovation. And I'm excited to have him on here because I'm always looking for people complementary to my practice. It's always uh, uh, good to have people who not only uh, know about intellectual property, but intellectual property is only part of what you need for a business. So uh, Eric is a master at knowing a lot of the other stuff about actually how to bring your product to market and manufacturing and that types of stuff. So I'd like to introduce uh, Eric Rose. How are you? I'm wonderful, Adam. Thanks for having me on today. Thank you. Yes. And we met at a um, kind of a business networking group, uh, a bunch of different people around who have different expertises. And uh, we thought that we were a good fit. Eric uh, had me speak at one of his inventors uh, groups about intellectual property. And um, so we're trying to get more of a collaboration between the two of us because I really think that a lot of my listeners uh, could benefit a lot from what he has to say and even some of his services. And at the end, we'll get to how uh, you can connect with Eric uh, if you would like some of his services. So Eric, can you tell me a little bit about your background and experience? Oh, sure. Well, I started tinkering when I was about 14 years old. I rebuilt my first toaster under my grandfather's supervision. And I was hooked on the idea of products and product design and manufactured product. And from there, you know, I went through uh, Cleveland Heights High School in Cleveland, Ohio as a machinist and learned how to use all those good machine shop tools. And then I went to Arizona State University where I got a Bachelor of Science in Product Design and Engineering and uh, launched my career professionally thereafter. And I know that you have, um, you're not just a business person, but you're also an inventor. Can you tell me a little bit about your, uh, your background as an inventor? Sure. I have over 65 patents that I'm the named inventor on, either issued or patent, either issued or patents granted worldwide. And they range from toys to technology to toilets and medical devices as well. And um, in some of your professional experience, like who have you worked with before in order to uh, help get their products to market? Oh, a wide variety. Although most of my clients today are healthcare professionals, I've had such a crazy smattering, including uh, Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, who I helped with a uh, soft collar um, and uh, soft puzzle. And enter the George Foreman grill, Michael Bohm, who uh, his name is on the original patent, and he had a new grill, and I was trying to help him commercialize his invention. But who's walking in the door tomorrow? Could be toys or technology or medical devices. And you know, in your experience, I know you've seen you know, a lot of startups, some do well and some don't do well. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about um, what is it for the ones that don't do well? Why is it that startups fail in general? Sure. Thanks, Adam. Well, there's an organization called CB Insights, and they published a report recently that said that 42% of all new startups that fail, fail because they deliver something to the market that the market doesn't value. And so what I've tried to do with my clients is to ensure that they spend the right amount of time and money understanding what the market would value before they spend too much time on research and development, such as building a prototype or even filing patents. Because as you know, patents can be laborious, can be expensive, and it's important to protect what the market would value. 
And, um, you know, it's always uh, good for me if someone actually wants to do a patent, but, uh, but I know it's not always the best thing. And I'm always upfront with my clients. I'm like, you know what, this uh, is going to be expensive. So just be aware of that. And also, you know, you don't want to be spending tons of money on patents uh, if that money is better spent on other aspects of your business. So some of the other uh, things, uh, you know, that you do is you have something called three keys to successful new products. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, about what those are? Be my pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Three keys to successful new products is all about giving inventors and entrepreneurs and startups and even some small businesses a framework of what they should be doing when. I find that so many entrepreneurs are running around like chickens with their heads cut off, excuse the expression, and really don't have a framework of how to move forward through the product innovation process. So I've come up with this three keys process, which goes like this. The first key is marketability. And marketability is all about understanding the anguish in the market, the go-to-market strategy, the business model, the competitive set, the prior art where you might need an IP attorney to help you get the lay of the land from a prior art patents perspective. All of that business scenario is first. Obviously, you don't want to develop something that nobody would value. The second key is technical feasibility. And technical feasibility is more than just developing a prototype. It's about designing, developing, manufacturing a product at a cost low enough where everyone in the distribution channel can actually make the margins they expect. So while I've met many clients that say, oh, I've got great engineers working on my team and it's a great product, they haven't looked at the cost aspect in enough detail. And ultimately, that's the hiccup in getting their product to market. And the third key is protectability. And generally with protectability, what I mean is that the entrepreneur needs to create a blanket of intellectual property. And Adam, this is really your domain where you're the expert. And that's about design patents, utility patents, copyrights, trademarks, maybe trade dress, and then even with some of my clients, I talk to them about creating an exclusivity agreement with suppliers. So I have one client who's got some technology in the healthcare field, and he needs a particular sensor from a particular supplier. And so I've been helping him to lock up an exclusivity agreement with that supplier and that particular medical market segment so that that supplier won't sell to any of his competitors for a period of time. So the three keys, again, are marketability first, technical feasibility second, and protectability third. And that really makes the difference to success. So Eric, it sounds like marketability is really important before you go too down far, far in the road uh, for your product. Can you expand a little bit about that? Sure. The most important key, that's key number one of the three keys is marketability, Adam. It's really about how do you know that what you believe is a great new product is valued by the market. And the system that I teach in marketability is really based upon Steve Blank's Lean Startup. And the key component of that is called customer discovery and product market fit. And what that means is the entrepreneur needs to go out and interview face-to-face -face what I call stakeholders. He typically calls them customers, but I like to expand that def definition a little bit and call it stakeholders. So stakeholders are direct customers, so like a dealer or distributor, and indirect customers like end users, but it also may be bloggers or other key opinion leaders, uh, any number of people that could be influential in getting your product to market should be interviewed. So I'll help my clients write non-leading interview questions. I'll help them discover 
the people to interview, help them do the interviewing if they need it, aggregate the insights, and come up then with a product specification that ranks the most important features that could place values that could then be used for the product development process. So that's really what I mean when we talk about customer discovery and product market fit in the market research key, that being marketability up front. Uh, Eric, let's talk a little bit about technical feasibility. Now, a lot of clients come in kind of with a rough prototype. Uh, is that the best way to do it? Or what are some suggestions that you have for uh, inventors and their technical feasibility uh, regarding their product? Sure. So technical feasibility encompasses many aspects. I love when inventors and entrepreneurs come in with a rough prototype because it allows everyone to get a 3D visualization quickly. And a lot of those prototypes are often what I call cut and cobble, meaning they put a bunch of things together, maybe that they found at Home Depot, and they glued it together in their garage. Now they have this quick and dirty 3D visualization, and that's great. But when you're really digging into the technical feasibility, you have to start looking at all the details of what are the material for mass production? What are the manufacturing processes that would be used? Who are the suppliers that could actually produce this? And can you go out and interview those suppliers about what are the best trade-offs in your product design to drive the cost of the product and the tooling down to the lowest possible costs? I also worked with one client who had a device, they got an inexpensive design really quick, and that allowed them to get a 3D rapid prototype model, but that design could never actually be produced in an injection mold. And so I and my team had to come in and clean it up because it needed to be designed with parting lines and draft and gates, all those things that are necessary, for example, looking at the manufacturing details. And that also helps to get quotes then from those suppliers under non-disclosure agreement so that you have a realistic view of what your product is going to cost. And that'll help to determine if it's feasible in the market. And the last key that you have is protectability. What can you say about uh, the best times to, in your opinion, contact patent attorneys? I like it when they contact me right away, but sometimes they'll contact you first. And what's your approach to uh, protectability? Sure. Well, there's nothing wrong, of course, with reaching out and talking to a patent attorney. Most inventors and entrepreneurs don't really have a sense of the right place and time to reach out to a patent attorney. I, patent attorney, I would say about 70% of the clients walking through my door have spent too much time on the technical feasibility and protectability and not enough time on marketability. But assuming that you've got through marketability and technical feasibility, then it's time to think about speaking to someone like you, Adam, and really understanding how to properly protect intellectual property. And that's all of the past copyrights, trademarks. And I don't mean calling LegalZoom because that's, you know, uh, send it in through the internet and hope for the best. They really need expert counsel to look at the design and counsel them, and that would be, of course, you. So normally what I do with my clients is I work with them to create at least a draft of an invention disclosure so they could go to someone like yourself, a patent attorney who's a real professional and can do the real filing, and be prepared. And I liken that to you don't want to go to your CPA just before tax time with a box full of receipts and not know what you got. Right. Yeah, you really want to go and spend time with a patent attorney prepared. And so to be able to discuss with a patent attorney, what's unique about your invention? What's the competition out there? What are their patents? You know, what do they claim? And then what's the story about why yours is so special? That's the most appropriate time to sit down with a patent attorney like yourself, able to have a real good heart-to-heart -heart discussion. 
Uh, Eric, what is the process if someone's interested in having your services? What do they, what do, they do first? How does it work? Sure. Well, of course, want to protect their intellectual property. And unlike an attorney who has essentially automatic non-disclosure agreement with the client, I actually need a formal non-disclosure agreement. So I have my clients fill out a brief form, which allows us to get them a non-disclosure, which protects their intellectual property. Once that's done, then I have a client intake form. And my clients tell me that takes about 40 minutes to fill out. And basically it covers asking the inventor a number of questions about marketability, technical feasibility, and protectability status of their invention. Once they said that back and anything else they want to, like a video demo of their prototype or whatever, I'll review all of that and have a call or a Zoom video nowadays with the client and give them my recommendations for what I think they need in order to move forward. And we collaborate on those next steps and then I'll write a consulting agreement for their consideration. So no money's exchanged until after they would agree to a go forward plan for development. Okay, and then the, the next steps, you know, once they want to go forward with you, uh, what are some of the common steps that will happen at that point? Sure. Well, at least 70% of the time, I find that the market research done isn't strong enough for a licensing pitch if the inventor wants to license his invention or isn't strong enough for an investor pitch. So if the inventor entrepreneur wants to pitch for money, friends, family, uh, angels, they really need a strong story about what the market values and uh, kind of arm's length research, and I'll help them to do that. Both primary research, where they do the interviews, and secondary research, where they'll find, let's say, government statistics that show data in the favor of the invention that they're planning on. So at least 70% of the time, we're gonna focus on that market research first, and then that'll help us to frame the downstream work particularly the product development engineering prototyping. All right, and what are the uh, best ways that people can contact you or find out more about you? Well, I always recommend they spend some time uh, on my website. That's ericpaulrose.com, E-R-I-C-P-A-U-L-R-O-S-E. Uh, they can look at my experience. Uh, there's numerous testimonials uh, from everybody, from inventors, entrepreneurs, corporations, uh, doctors, all kinds of healthcare professional testimonials there. There's even a page there of all my patents that can be read. Some are interesting, some are boring. But what I will say is the story about my patents is most of those 65 plus patents have actually made money. Whereas, as you know, Adam, over 90% of all the patents in the United States don't make money. I've been fortunate enough to work on high value intellectual property in most of mine have made money and all that's on my website. Yeah, I've heard that 70% uh, of inventors think that they're going to make at least a million dollars. And then the fact is, I think that, uh, you know, less than 5% make any money. So there's a big disconnect there. And uh, because of that, hopefully by working with uh, you or me or both, uh, either, you know, get a little reality check. Um, you know, they may have the next million dollar idea, but uh, just be prepared. Um, about the reasons why you might not. And hopefully you won't dig yourself into a financial hole, um, you know, dreaming about something that maybe isn't going to come to fruition as, as much as uh, they like it to be. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience to wrap up your thoughts on this topic? Yes, Adam, that'd be great. So just a reminder, um, the innovation process, this is what I say in the first class, first evening class that I teach on product innovation. I always say, Innovation is messy. It's chaotic. It's crazy. It's often two steps forward, one back, three to the right, four to the left. Then you come forward a little bit, fall back. And you, as an inventor and entrepreneur, need to be patient with the fact that it is chaotic. And that's why I hope uh, for your listeners that my three keys to successful new products marketability, technical feasibility, protectability, will give them a framework to keep them on the straight and narrow during their uh, product innovation process. 
Well, thanks so much for coming on my show. Um, it's always good to hear people with other perspectives and actually a lot of experience in the business side, since I'm mostly on the intellectual property side. Uh, like I said, it's always good to have a uh, balanced mix of people on your team to help you achieve your, your goals for your business and product. And thanks for being on my show once again. And uh, good luck with everybody and their inventions. Happy inventing, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Patenting for Inventors podcast with host Adam Diamond. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review on iTunes. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only. The facts of every legal matter are unique and the content of this podcast should not be construed as offering legal advice for your specific legal situation. For more information and help with your own intellectual property needs, contact Adam Diamond at patentingforinventors.com. That's patentingforinventors.com or call Diamond Patent Law at 424-281-0162. The preceding information may be considered an attorney advertisement and does not establish any attorney-client relationship.